Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Daniel 6 is such a rich chapter that I wasn't able to put in all the good things that I found there So uh, last week. So I'm going to be preaching from Daniel 6 again. So let me read that and then we'll take a look at it. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom and over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days except to you, O king, <clears throat> shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so they cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or king within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad, and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found in him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. 
Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You could also translate that during the reign of Darius, that is Cyrus the Persian. So not clear if that's one or two people there, probably two. Well, let's pray and then we'll look at this chapter. <clears throat> Lord, uh, thank you for this chapter in Daniel that has uh, so many beneficial things for us. And I pray that we'd see that as we look at it now and your Spirit, enlighten our hearts and minds to uh, believe your word and to do it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One thing worth noting in this chapter is that Daniel was around 90 years old when he went into the lion's den. Sunday school literature and other pictures often depict Daniel as being a teenager in the lion's den, but actually he was uh, quite elderly. You're never too old to be used by God. Abraham was 75, Moses was 80, and Aaron was 83 when they were called into God's service. Granted, people lived longer back then, but they were still quite a long in years when God called them. You're never too old to be used by God. You're never too old either to start following God. And you're never too old to be called in by God into some new form of service for him. In 2 Kings 13, a man who had died was thrown into the prophet Elisha's grave for temporary safekeeping. And when his body touched the bones of Elisha, he actually came back to life. He immediately sprung back to life. So God was still using Elisha even after he was dead. You're not as old as Elisha, though some mornings you might feel that way. <laughs> so the Lord can still use you too, no matter how old you are. Keep on keeping on then for God, or start following him today, even if you're well along in years. It's never too late. Which brings up another point. We don't stop running the race here on earth until we cross the finish line in heaven. As long as we're in this world, we run in God's course and not a moment short of that. It's been said that few great men finish well, but that wasn't the case with Daniel. He ran the race faithfully all the way to the end, as St. Clair Ferguson points out. Here in Massachusetts, of course, we have the Boston Marathon and its infamous Heartbreak Hill. A runner will get to the 20-mile mark and think, almost there, just six more miles to go, <laughs> but what a six mile is it, or at least what a mile plus of hill there is before him or her yet. That hill is where champions could be made or broken. And old age could be like that with its increased losses, heartbreak, and diminished capacities. Daniel shows us, though, that with God's help, we can not only finish the race, we can finish strong with a kick. With the Lord's help, we can live out all, our li and all the days of our lives well for him. So pray that God will give you that uh, grace to serve him well all the days of your life till you get to the end also. You won't be disappointed with the prize you receive when you get to the end. Another point that this chapter brings out is that God can cause a very godly life to grow in a very ungodly environment. Daniel was a very godly man in an, in an environment that was not all conducive to godliness and spiritual growth, it seems. As McLaren writes, a beautiful and devout character can grow in very unfavorable soil. One can be holy in any setting. If we find ourselves in a spiritual desert like Daniel and his friends were, God can make us grow up like an Arizona cactus, nevertheless. We can flourish in any environment, just as Daniel and his friends did, as the Lord turns even his negative factors to our spiritual advantage. 
I often refer to this, as you know, as spiritual weightlifting. Through opposition, we get stronger. Or we can tack into those head, headwinds coming out. We can adjust our sails, trusting and obeying the God. So that even those headwinds we can use to keep us going toward our heavenly port. Anyway, what was it that allowed Daniel, and not just Daniel again, but his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to bloom in the desert, to thrive in such seemingly hostile surroundings? I think there are at least three things they did which are on display in verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. First and foremost, Daniel prayed regularly. He kept open that spiritual lifeline to God. We can't live underwater very long on our own. The environment quickly becomes inhospitable to us unless we have a lifeline to the world above. And that's exactly what prayer is. Prayer connects, connects us to the power and life-giving spiritual oxygen of the world above and allows us to really live in spite of the opposition we face down here. So if we're going to thrive in the desert like that Arizona cactus does, we're going to have to pray a lot. It's vital for us. Secondly, notice where Daniel prays. He prays toward Jerusalem. Daniel's body may have been in Babylon, but his heart was in Jerusalem, in the kingdom of God. Where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. Daniel's first loyalty was still to the kingdom of God in Jerusalem, even though he had great wealth and high position in the kingdom of Persia. That's what allowed him to say no to the king, no to his high position, no to his great wealth, no to his very life if necessary, because he knew that he had an even better life and a better inheritance in a better city that was coming in the future from God. Daniel's first loyalties were in Jerusalem and the kingdom of his God. Our loyalties will have to be there also in the new Jerusalem in the kingdom of God if we're going to stand for God as Daniel and his friends did. Their first loyalty wasn't to the king or to the empire, but to God and his kingdom, and nothing was going to change that. This gave Daniel and his friends the, the strength to stand when they needed to, to do, and it will do the same for us also. Thirdly, notice what Daniel did in the midst of all his difficulties. In, in addition to crying out to God, he gave thanks before his God. This is really remarkable. Daniel's about to go into a den of lions, and he's giving thanks to God. What's he thanking him for? The only way you can thank God in such situations is if you truly believe God's in control of everything and he knows what's best for you. And what's more, he can be trusted to do what's best for you in every situation, just as the Bible declares. The only way to give thanks in all things as the scriptures command us to do, and as Daniel does here, is to believe that God is working for our good in all things, which the scripture also declares, and as Daniel proves for us here. If in all our troubles we'll just hold to the fact, hold fast to the fact that the Lord is sovereign over all things and working them all for our good, uh, we'll be able to give him thank, thanks in all things, and we'll see his perfect plan for our lives unfolding as well, just as it for, did for Daniel here. Now, frankly, sometimes God's perfect plan allows us to be killed by the lions in the den, as sometimes it allows us to be delivered from them, as in the case with Daniel. In some cases, it's not God's plan for us to escape. But even then, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. No one martyred for Christ ever had any complaint about it the split second after he departed from the earth. And they'd have made that same bargain a thousand times over again if you could ask them about it. They've traded their cross for a crown, their persecutions for a paradise, a farthing for a fortune beyond all measure. 
they have no complaints because their troubles are all behind them and ahead of them lies only eternal, everlasting joys. Another point this chapter brings up, much as in the case of chapter 3, is that God will be with us even in the midst of our sufferings, just as the angel of the Lord was in the fiery furnace with Daniel's three friends to deliver them. Uh, so too, he was, his angel was with Daniel in the lion's den to protect him and shut the lion's mouth. And that will be the case for us also uh, as we remain faithful to the Lord. He'll be with us in all our afflictions also. He'll either deliver us out of them as he did for these men, or he'll sustain us through them uh, as he did for others. And we can count on him for that in every trial and tribulation. Whether we're suffering because we refuse to do something, which God's forbidden us to do, as it was for the three friends in chapter 3, or because we refuse to abstain from doing something which God has commanded us to do, as we see here in chapter 6 with Daniel, the Lord will be there with us to help us shoulder the burden. We'll never be alone in these things. As Tremper Longman writes, the two chapters together thus encourage later readers to avoid false religion and to pursue legitimate religion, no matter what the cost. We see proof of this in Daniel and Darius's contrasting responses to the lion's den. Uh, Darius was completely flustered and, and ill at ease. It says that sleep fled from him that night. He couldn't find any rest that night. Daniel, on the other hand, emerged from the lion's den totally unruffled. He greeted the king calmly and politely without any indication of resentment. O king, live forever. Daniel had a more restful night in the lion's den than Darius did in his palace. God is able to give us more peace in a den full of lions than the wicked have in their well-appointed palaces. The key then to having real peace in our lives is to live godly lives because then the Lord will be with us wherever we are and he'll grant us perfect peace there. A right relationship with God as we saw in the last chapter can bring us more peace and security than great wealth and great walls can. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Proverbs 15, 16. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. Proverbs 16, 8. Better to be the victim of injustice than the doers of injustice, as McLaren writes. It's worth noting, too, how forgiving Daniel was toward Darius in spite of what he had done to him. Here he is having cast Daniel into a den of lions, yet Daniel is still courteous and respectful toward him. There's no hint of bitterness here. Uh, Daniel's reply is calm and polite, observing courtly protocol, as one states. Part of this perhaps was because Daniel realized that Darius had been duped. And he really was on Daniel's side. Uh, Darius' actions reflected more of his weakness and his wickedness toward Daniel. Nevertheless, it's still remarkable how forgiving Daniel seems to be toward the king. Another benefit of trusting that everything that happens to us must first pass through the hands of a loving God is that it makes it easier for us to forgive people who have mistreated us. We can say, as Joseph said before us to his brothers who he forgave, you, uh, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Daniel could see how the Lord had used these events for good to bring glory to his great name and also to expose his enemies. Uh, first, the true God was glorified throughout the world by means of this incredible deliverance. The chapter begins with an edict for everyone to honor King Darius. It ends with an edict for everyone to give glory to the one true God of Israel, who alone can perform such wonders. The Lord also used this event for good by ridding his people of many dangerous enemies. As Warren Wearsby observes, if Darius had consulted Daniel first, 
The plot of these evil doers might have been exposed, but maybe God allowed it to happen so he could purge these evil doers from the kingdom as a threat to his people. It probably was easier for Daniel to forgive Darius when he realized how God was in the process of using all these events for his good and the good of others. Uh, we see the just judgment upon these evildoers in verse 24. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. The fact that they reached the floor of the lion's den uh, um, before they were killed before they even reached the floor of the lion's den. It shows that Daniel's deliverance was truly a miraculous one. It was supernatural. Uh, these lions hadn't been fed or drugged or defanged by some friends of Daniel to help them out before him. And that's evidenced by what these lions did to the, the malefactors there. And we can understand this judgment on the conspirators they had tried to frame and murder an innocent man in cold blood. They had attacked Daniel without any just cause. And they had lied to the king and tried to rob him of his best servant in the process, as Gleason Archer points out. When they suffered the fate that they had planned for Daniel, they were just being paid back in their own coin. They were just getting what they had intended for Daniel and his family if he had any. It was straight up justice. Still, this judgment on the family seems uh, quite severe, especially to our modern ears. Why were they executed also? Well, there are a few points to be made here. First of all, this is simply the way things were done back then. It wasn't unusual in the ancient Near East, including Persia, for families to share in the guilt and punishment of the guilty. One of the reasons for that is that it prevented blood feuds blood feuds in which the family of the executed would feel honor bound to avenge the death of their relative. As cruel a practice as it was, it ironically might have saved lives in the long run, given the violent nature of the culture of that day, in that it short-circuited, albeit by bloody means, the long-standing blood feuds which were quite common. Not a good thing, perhaps, but perhaps less bloody than the alternative. Secondly, it's very easy for us in our modern era, especially a modern Christianized society uh, to some degree, to armchair quarterback these things. If you had seen your entire family butchered or potentially butchered before your eyes, you might be a lot more sympathetic to this point of view, even if perhaps still not agreeing with it. Finally, and probably most relevantly, sometimes the Bible reports things without comment just to let us know what happened without necessarily stopping to issue any moral judgment on them. As John Goldinger writes, it could be the author isn't making any moral comment on the inclusion of the families in this punishment other than to say, this is how life is, so be careful. Daniel isn't necessarily endorsing the practice as other parts of the Bible don't, except for exceptional God-commanded occasions, and we'll leave that for another day. Daniel was just perhaps re reporting the facts of what happened and warning others in this day what could likewise befall them if they engaged in similar practices. Our evil actions can have negative, act uh, negative consequences, ju not just for us, but also for others around us whom we love. And that's still true for us today. We, we discussed this last week online in our service. None of us sins in a vacuum. Our sins often have harmful effects on the people around us, too. If a man commits a crime and goes to jail, for example, that will have many negative ramifications for his wife and children also. If a person develops a drug or alcohol problem, that will likely neg negatively affect everyone around them, too, and so on. No man or woman is an island. The things we do, good or bad, affect others around us. 
Finally, one more point from verse 28. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Kings came and kings went, but somehow Daniel is still left standing. Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar went by the wayside, as did a few lesser kings in between. They're not mentioned in the book, but that was the case. The empire changed from, changed from Babylon to Persia, and yet in the midst of all, somehow Daniel is still left standing after all said and done. God had amazingly protected Daniel for the full 70 years of the exile, despite, despite the constant threats and dangers around him. Daniel got to see God's promise of his people returning to their homeland against all odds, fulfilled in his lifetime. I think one author has summed it up well. Daniel's entire life was spent in exile in a metaphorical lion's den, yet God preserved him alive and unharmed throughout the whole of that time. Another king comes with another kingdom. Kingdoms rise and fall, but Daniel, the symbol of the kingdom of God, remains, writes another. That stone cut without human hand remains while the rest are gone or on their way to going already. This is prophetic for all the people of God. When all the kingdoms of this world and all the evildoers within have been judged and have perished, the true believer in God will still be left standing in spite of it all, and the meek shall inherit the earth. Daniel not only got to see the promise of the return of the Jews to their homeland, homeland Israel fulfilled in his lifetime, he also likely had a major hand in it. God had Daniel in the right place to still to help advance his kingdom, as Daniel likely helped uh, Cyrus, the emperor, craft his edict to send the Jews back to Israel, complete with funds from the empire to pay for the rebuilding of the temple. Daniel was faithful to God all his days, so God was faithful to Daniel to the very end. Amen.